World War II and he was in the Army Air Corps. So Charles, um, let me ask you first of all, talk a little bit about your background growing up here in Stratford and um, the family, where you grew up and so forth. Just a little bit about yeah. your background. Well, I lived in Stratford all my life and I lived at uh, uh, Johnson Avenue uh, by Nichols School and uh, played uh, a lot of sports and uh, had uh, in, in we had, that was during the depression and uh, we didn't know we didn't have money <laughs> but it was a, a great era and I lived on Johnson Avenue with all the Swedes and uh, we got along great together and uh, like I say we played a lot of sports and and, uh, and then I went to Stratford High School. Before you get to Stratford High, can you tell me who was Miss Merlat? Oh, my teacher. She was a teacher. Uh, Mrs. Bur Merlat was um, uh, my sixth grade teacher. At which school? At Nichols School. And what did she call you? She had a nickname for you. Oh, what did she call, what did, she call me? Uh, was it Little... Little uh, nutmeg? No, the, my nutmeg, yeah, my little nutmeg, yes. And, and you, you remember her? Yeah, uh, yeah I remember her. Not, was fondly, nice teacher? Oh, yeah, they were all nice. And the, it, one of the strange things, my second grade teacher was Mrs. Dunbar, who was married to a, a Walter Dunbar, who was a, a colonel in the Army. And he was my first boss uh, when I worked in the town hall in engineering. And it's just a, wow. a funny little side uh, track of what happened. Could you also mention uh, the firehouse? Do you hang around a firehouse? Yeah, there was a uh, right across the street at the intersection of of uh, uh, Johnson Avenue and Nichols Avenue. Right across from the Nichols School was a firehouse. And uh, there was a volunteer firehouse, and Hans Lundgren was, uh, and his father was the chief of the uh, volunteers. And Hans was there, and upstairs was a hall that uh, they had weddings up there. And then there was a little shop uh, attached to the building that uh, there was a shoemaker there, Mr. Schramm. I always remember their names. And uh, markets, meat markets. Uh, uh, the, it was a, they called Davy Brothers, who became the first national. It was right across the street uh, from uh, from the near the school. You also in the summer you went swimming. What, what was some well, of these places you went? Well, to? was it swimming? That was another story where we used to walk down to Longbrook Park, and they just made the Longbrook Park, and there was a little pool. And uh, we, it was only about uh, waist deep, but we cooled off. And, uh, by the, and then we'd walk home, which was over probably a couple of miles. And, uh, and we, we got all warmed up walking home again. Uh, talk about uh, going to high school and, and some, maybe some of the teachers. Are... Well, in, in the high school, we... Uh, uh, there was Earl Flagg, I remember, he was a printing teacher, and uh, I forget the names of some of the other teachers I had, uh, but I remember Earl Flagg because he was, uh, he, he was uh, a printing uh, instructor, and he, 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 uh, he was in charge of the band, and uh, did a good job, and everybody knew Earl Flagg. Didn't you also... Um know somebody by the name of Eddie, Eddie, Eddie Byman? Byman, sure, Eddie what Byman. About him, yeah. Well, Eddie Byman was a very good friend of mine who lived on on Johnson Avenue, and he was uh, Swedish, and uh, and he he became a very good friend of mine, and he became a navigator on a B-24 bomber that flew over the hump during the war. And uh, we bumped into each other uh, in several places. You always bumped into someone from Stratford in the Air Force. Now, one of your classmates was killed, was Well, it? John Latanzi was, uh, I think he was a navigator or a, 
I don't know if he was a pilot and a bomber, and he got killed. And a very nice fellow, and I'll always remember him. So you graduated in? 1943 I graduated, and uh, I joined the Army Air Force at that time at Sterling House. We signed up, a bunch of us signed up there, and they wouldn't call us until we turned 18. So after I graduated, I was 17 yet, so I went and uh, worked for Chance Watt, riveting Corsair. So I was there for about eight months or so after, after I graduated, waiting to be called into the Air Force, and I was a, I riveted uh, the uh, the fuselage of the Corsair parts of the tail section and the midsection. So and you so you, excuse me, but so you wanted to go into the service. Was that a prevalent mood of uh, uh, young men young at that men, time? Yes, we had a lot of people, a lot of us. Uh, we, we uh, went right into the into the armed forces after graduation, or even before. Some some of them went before. You could join the navy when you were sixteen, and some of them did that. And they, so at, at that age, what, what was it compelling you to want to go into the service? Well, it was it was something we we felt that uh, we didn't like what happened at Pearl Harbor, and we wanted to rectify everything. And uh, and then you had some bad characters around the world that had to be straightened out and so everybody, m most of my friends joined. So let's talk about where you went. You, you, you went to Fort Devens, was it first? I went to Fort Devens at first, uh, that's where they called me from and, uh, they, and then they assigned us to basic training and uh, uh, Fort Devens was Massachusetts and they assigned me to uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, for basic training, and uh, for, and from Greensboro, where you know you just learned your basics uh, of soldiering and uh, bivouacking or whatever, uh, and then they assigned us to a gunnery school in in. Uh, uh, it was in, in the, Texas, right? In, in, the, in the Greensboro, oh, there, I'm sorry, no, not Greensboro, that's, Greensboro was the basic. Uh, was it at, Harling, was Harling, it Harlington? Harlingen, Texas. Right. It's the very tip of Texas on the Rio Grande. And uh, we went through, and there I, it was the first time I ever shot a gun. Uh, and we shot from a BB gun all the way up to uh, 45s, uh, 22s, uh, shot, shotguns, skeet, uh, and a 30 caliber and a 50 caliber machine guns, and uh, so it was quite a, uh, it was a vigorous training, and they, we had to learn uh, every part of the, of the machine gun, the caliber 50 uh, machine gun, and. Uh, I'll always remember the uh, smallest part was had the longest name, and and uh, uh, I don't remember any of the parts anymore. You had to be able to assemble them. Well, we had uh, you had to be able to take it apart and put it back together, and and uh, we did that uh, every day, and then we had to even blindfold it and with gloves on. We had a field strip of caliber fifty. Because flying high altitude, it was you know sixty below zero. You had to have your gloves on, uh, so it was quite an experience. And we had uh, we we were we were we like I say we we started off with a BB gun, and then we even we went to forty fives and uh, and uh, shotguns. We did a lot of skeet. When you became, but you had not on a plane yet. What, what point well, do you get on a plane? Well, to... after we learned uh, uh, about the machine guns and how to fire all the other uh, uh, machine guns and whatever, uh, then they then we got onto a AT six, and, and it was an open cockpit, and we we'd fly. It had a handheld on or like a ring. You would hold a thirty caliber, and you fire between the the wing and the tail at these targets down on the water of the uh, Rio Grande. And uh, 
I remember the fellow before me, he put a hole through the wing and the pilot wasn't too happy. <laughs> so, so anyway, well, that's, and then we started to fly uh, in the B, uh, B-24 and uh, uh, we would shoot at a sleeve that was told by a B-26 and they'd have a long uh, sleeve way out the way from the plane, make sure we wouldn't hit the tow train plane. And, and all our bullets we had, everybody had their own color. And uh, so we could see how we did on, and when we landed. And we used to uh, gamble a little bit on that uh, score, you know. I held, my, uh, I held up pretty good. They didn't give you ratings like marksmanship or expert? Not, 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 not with that, no. Okay. No. Now you, you went from there to uh, Wyoming? I, well, from there, I, that's where I, I met uh, Ed, my friend Eddie Byman. He was going through the same school I was uh, as a navigator. And, uh, and then uh, after graduating from uh, Harlingen, we, the, most of the gutters were assigned crews. That's where the crews were formed. And uh, I wasn't assigned a crew, but I became, I was in a, uh, a, uh, a, a, what do you call it? Re a, like a replacement? A repla yeah, a, and a pool. A pool. A pool. And, uh, and we would, uh, we had have to wait for, uh, and then we were all shipped to Casper, Wyoming. That's where the crews went, and I went with them, and uh, was in the pool, and uh, we were training there, even though we weren't on a crew, we still trained. And, uh, and then one day I was called in uh, to replace a nose gunner that got killed in a crash. On a B, they, they, they had about 14 gunners on a B-24 one day, and uh, they all needed so much time in air-to-air to, air to air gunnery, and they so they put a bunch of them on one plane, and that, unfortunately that crashed, and... Uh, one of the nose gunners got killed, so I replaced them. And so we had we went through. I went through training with the with the crew. And, uh, and how did they treat you as a as well, a replacement? That, well, as a replacement, you can imagine that you're taking over a good friend of theirs, and they didn't, you know, they didn't look look up to you as being a replacement, and their good friend is no longer with them. So you can't blame. That strange feeling you get, you know, but uh, we uh, we went through training and um, and 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 we uh, I'll always remember we had one more one more flight and training flight two thirty in the morning briefing and uh, I didn't feel good. We needed only that one one more mission and then we would be sent overseas. Okay. And when I went to sick call, because I didn't feel well, and there, I remember the uh, flight surgeon, he was a major, and he wasn't too happy because he had to get up 2.30 in the morning. And there was another fellow before me and he didn't examine him at all either and he just told him to go on up and fly and he asked me the same thing and I said, I don't feel good. and he. He says, oh, you're all right, you look fine, go on up and fly. So we, I went, we went, we're only 18 years old, and, <laughs> and whatever the flight surgeon said, that's what we did, but I was, I didn't feel well. So anyway, we flew, and while we were flying, we are flying over in Casper, uh, Wyoming, over the Rocky Mountains in formation. And uh, when you're in formation over the Rockies, you, the air, air currents, uh, threw you all over the place. You go up 100, 200 feet, down, up and down, you're in formation. The whole crew got air sick. And so we landed right away and we, they told us to go to sick call. So we went to sick call and there's the same flight surgeon. And this time he put a thermometer in my mouth and he says, why didn't you come to sick call this morning? I could have punched him in the nose. <laughs> And, and so he said, you, you have pneumonia, you have to go to the hospital. So I went to the hospital, and while I was in the hospital, my crew shipped out, and they went over to Italy to the 15th Air Force. And I uh, 
never heard from him. And uh, so I always said, uh, maybe having pneumonia may have saved my life. I don't know, whatever happened to him. So anyway, that's what happened. I got on another crew. And uh, this time, uh, he replaced another nose gunner. And we ha I remember the radio operator, his name was Arky. And uh, Arky was Ar from Arkansas, that's what he called him, Arky. And he was a veteran of 20, I don't know, I'm over 20 missions, I think. And he got shot down over the Polesti oil fields way at the beginning of the war there. And he, he, he bailed out over the Mediterranean. And the next day he was picked up, he was lucky. And he wanted to go over again, which I thought was kind of stupid of him, but that's what he wanted. Well, Arky was a, a great gambler. He was a little fella. And he, he won a, a 1936 Ford. And um, and when I asked Harky one day, I would you take me up to Casper Mountain because a fellow that I knew from Stratford, he was a pilot on a B-24. His name was Dick Zorn, and he hit the top of the mountain, got killed with his crew, and I wanted to see where he hit. So I, Harky took me up to the top of Casper Mountain, and. Sure enough, you could see where Dick Zorn hit, and if he was up another 100 or 200 feet, he would have missed the mountain. See, in those days, when you were flying in formation and the, the weather closed in, you, everybody started to go towards, went to the field, and everybody was trying to land, and so it was pretty hairy. You, could, you had to be up the lookout for, uh, for other, uh, other planes, and... Uh, so it was it was tricky. So anyway, after we finished training again, uh, we were shipped uh, to uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, for a couple of weeks to be assigned to wherever we were going to go overseas or just what. Well, in those days, it was uh, just the beginning of radar bombing, and so. Uh, our crew was selected to go to Langley Field to pick up a radar operator, uh, which was something new in those days. And so we we went to Langley Field, Virginia, and uh, picked up the radar operator. Went through training with with him on board, and and then they had to get rid of one of the gunners, which was me. I was one of the the last ones, you know. I replaced the nose gunner. So they got rid of me, and uh, and then they 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 went overseas. I don't even know where they went, and uh, and then I was shipped to um, Westover Air Force Base for uh, overseas training again as a pool, and I uh, finally got on a on a crew and uh, went through that training again, the same training I did in Casper. And uh, we used to fly over uh, Stratford. This was one of our turning points, Stratford, uh, for navigation training. And we hit here and we go down to Langley Field, turn around, go back up to Westover. And uh, one uh, one of the fellow, one of the crews in our barracks was a, a veteran crew that had 25 missions, and they uh, they uh, they were going overseas again, and but they still had to go through training again. So I remember it was a pretty big guy. He was a radio operator, and he he wanted to get in the ball turret to see how it was, how you how it felt going about ball turret. That was their crew, and. For, what they tell me, he got into the ball turret, they lowered him down, and then they went over over the, uh, uh, near the ocean, uh, off of uh, Boston and that, to shoot at targets and things, and the pilot was going to scare him. So he flew very low, with the ball hanging down, and he misjudged, and he hit the water, and the ball turret came out, and he, he, he got killed and the plane almost crashed. And the 
the pilot was court-martialed and uh, they, they no longer went, uh, became a crew. So anyway, then uh, we finished training. Could you mention one more thing yeah. that you had told me? Uh, you heard music once. Oh, that that's right. Oh, music. yeah. I was going to say, I was. we were flying one night over Boston area, and uh, I didn't have my headset on. I was out in the, out in the waste gun, uh, waste area, and uh, I was hearing music. And I thought, well, I'm looking all around, and what's going on? I'm hearing this music, and I heard it for... 30, 30 seconds to a minute, and uh, then, it, then it went away. And and I told the fellows on the crew, and they, they thought I was a little batty. <laughs> but uh, years after the war, I heard a program, and, and uh, Lucille Ball was being questioned, was on it, and she said she was flying one day in the airline, and she heard music through her teeth, fillings in her teeth, like I did. And and uh, it was very interesting, and then and believe it or not, by Ripley also had it that some people can pick up radio waves uh, like a crystal set through fillings, and that's why what, what I heard. But I only heard it at one time. Strange. So anyway, then we uh, we got shipped to California and. Uh, to get to California. That wasn't a pleasant trip, was it? No, with the kid, to get to California, that was on a troop train. And uh, that was the craziest ride you ever want to see. There was no, we weren't in sleepers. We had to sleep up uh, in a chair. And, and uh, every town that we, we stopped at every little town. And when you looked down the train, when we stopped, we, uh, you could see all the all the troops running into town to get something to drink, beer or what, whatever they were drinking, and uh, that was a craziest ride you want to see. And uh, I used to sleep in the in the mess car uh, underneath the, a big table that had a shelf, and I used to sleep there at night. It's the only place you get a decent sleep, uh, some sleep. But anyway, on, the, on going across country, it was quite a ride. And uh, I remember stopping in the Chicago station, and the first thing most of us did was take a shower. It was pretty. We were pretty raunchy. And then we uh, we'd stop at the uh, rail yards, and and uh, there'd be a freight train, and there was one train I remember. We all got off, and they opened the door, and there was watermelon. So somebody, a couple of them got up, a couple of guys got up and and they were throwing the watermelon. As we ran past, we caught them and we took them in the train and we were going to eat them. Well, the funny part about it, they weren't even ripe. Well, the next station, the MPs were waiting for us. And they said, okay, we need so much money from everybody to pay for the watermelons you stole. So that, that was quite a trip. So when we ended up in the Boise, Idaho, where we were going to be assigned to uh, overseas a, a bomb squadron, a bomb group. And so we had to pick up an airplane uh, and uh, picked up a brand new B-24. And they told us that we could uh, we could get a case of liquor a piece. So we had 10 cases of liquor that we put on board the plane. And uh, when we flew overseas to all the islands, uh, all the uh, infantrymen knew that we had liquor aboard and they used to try to offer us a, a souvenir of some kind from the Japanese army or whatever. It was quite a quite an exca uh, experience. But anyway, we we started to fly to uh, uh, to the South Pacific, and we're on our way to Hawaii, and we're out about and uh, on the B-24 to fly that far, which took us 14 and a half hours. You had to have auxiliary uh, gasoline tanks in the Bombay, which is big, rush uh, rubberized 
uh, tanks and they had vents out the side of the plane and so we're flying uh, to Hawaii and we're out a oh, good two hours and uh, the uh, smell of gasoline was unbelievable. If anybody struck a match we would have gone up and smoked and called the pilot and said this, this is bad news and he came back and he just wanted to turn back and I, I said well another two and a half hours to go back uh, we'd be out and you could the gas would be low the uh, the ports and it would probably stop so that's what we did we kept going if you had put your mask on would that have stopped the smell well the smell it's no no because you well you yeah you could put it into the oxygen yeah but it's a smell but it was it was it was very dangerous and 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 uh, like I say, if anyone struck a match, we'd have gone right up. But uh, so we kept going, and we got out of the waist because it, it go up front because that's be, uh, below the the smell. You see, so that's how we got out of the smell. But uh, but the, the, I remember uh, Pat, our bombardier was Patsy Canizio from Long Island, and he had his prayer beads out, and he was praying <laughs> praying that we would blow up. Well, we got to Hawaii and we flew over, over uh, all the mess in in Honolulu area. Cry, that was a mess. And um, so then we we stayed there for a couple of months, not months, no weeks. And then we loaded up and we uh, took off for New Guinea. And on the way to New Guinea, we stopped at Tarawa. And uh, Landed there at a one only one little strip air, airfield where that they captured, and on Tarawa there wasn't a tree standing. It was so bleak. It was unbelievable, and there was only one blockhouse right in the middle of the island that the Japs made, and it was about three feet thick, and there was a direct hit from a from a a big battleship shell that went right, blew a hole right through. You could walk through the hole. So uh, uh, there was, like I say, there wasn't a tree standing, but off to, you could walk to the next little attached island, and that's where all the natives were. And it always surprised me that the Japs didn't go over to fight from there too, but they didn't. So that's what saved the natives. They stayed in their island and and uh, our troops hit hit the main island. And, uh, uh, I remember uh, a fellow that I went to school with, Aubrey Howell, he got killed on Tarawa. And that was quite a mess. Tarawa was, uh, they miscalculated the tide and they had, when they left their landy craft, they had to walk through chest high water with their guns up high and the Japs plinked them off and we bombed the heck out of them before, uh, I wasn't there at the time, but I'm saying the bombers, they bombed and shelled that island unbelievably, but the Japs were dug in with coconut trees as their shelter and that the coconut trees could give it was better than having concrete, and they they lived through it and uh, they really greeted our boys with some heavy fire and it was a mess. So from there we gashed up and we went to uh, the next island, uh, Los Negros, I think the name of it was, on our way to New Guinea. And we guessed there, and then we went to New uh, uh, to New Guinea, small island off New Guinea, and uh, that's where our bomb group uh, and squadron started way years before, and so we just followed their trail up. So we stayed there though, but uh, two weeks or so, and uh, did a little swimming and. And uh, it was very nice R and R there, and then we, then we, uh, from there we went to that. Uh, 
we, we were flying to uh, the Philippines was our going to be our next uh, big stop, but we had to stop at an island to gas up in between the Philippines and New Guinea. And on this island there was uh, probably about five to 10,000 Japanese prisoners, I remember. They were fenced in. And it was an Aussie island, and they told us to, while your ga planes were getting gassed up, you'd go have some coffee and donuts in the, go through the jungle, and you got a little stand there, and uh, they'll give you some coffee and donuts. And went through the jungle area and came out by the station, the stand, and uh, I looked down, and there's this sailor sitting on a log in his dress uniform, I guess going on R&R, and, &R, and I looked down at him, I said, Al, what, Al, what are you doing in a place like that? It was a, a, one of my classmates that I graduated with a, about 10 months before, and he was, he was there and he looked uh, forlorn there with, with his hands in his, his chin in his hands, and uh, we looked up, that was a big laugh, and uh, so then we, uh, Al become a manager of uh, Olson Marine in Stratford years later. But then we took off again to uh, go to Leyte, uh, Clark Field. And, uh, and, and, but our, our uh, bomb group already moved up to Ayashima uh, right off Okinawa. And uh, so we stayed at Clark Field for a couple of weeks. And all this traveling and time uh, really helped me because I didn't, I didn't catch up with the bomb groups. I didn't go all, on all these missions. So in that way, I was fortunate. But uh, we, finally, we finally got to uh, Aishima, uh, which was a little little island with a was similar to Tarawa but it had a little mountain in it and, and uh, on it at one end and there was tunnels all over the mountains where the Japs were hiding and Ernie Pyle was at the uh, when the, the Marines took over the island but they were still fighting and uh, Tony that's where Tony Bredis from Stratford was a Marine and he was one of the ones that uh, took over the island with the Marines. And he had, uh, from what I understand, Tony said he had a cigarette with Ernie Pyle. But Ernie Pyle got killed by a sniper a few weeks later, or whatever. And uh, I'll always remember that. And uh, that's where we, our bomb group was, and we went on a couple of missions, and the, and the, the the atomic bomb was dropped, so we were fortunate that we didn't have to fly to, we only flew about four missions, and they were what we call milk runs. There wasn't much to them. I don't think, I don't even think we were fired on. I don't know. But anyway. Where, where were your missions to? Well, we were, we were flying uh, like uh, to uh, Formosa. There was a Japanese <clears throat> base at Formosa, and, and along the Chinese uh, we weren't too far from Chan, China, you know. Okinawa wasn't too far from China. But we're right, we're about, we're about uh, 15, 20 miles from Okinawa, just like Stratford to uh, Long Island. And uh, so uh, while we were there, the, the war ended. And, uh, and I remember the Jap, uh, when the, they were going to sign the peace treaty. The Japanese ambassadors landed on Aishima, the island, and they had their top hats and their long uh, coats. Uh, and uh, they went over to uh, Okinawa to uh, the battleship Missouri where they signed the uh, peace treaty with MacArthur and uh, all our our delegates and so we uh, 
So we were there at the uh, at the end of the war, and after the war was over and signed up, uh, the peace treaty was signed. We we got to fly to uh, Jap Japan after a, a month or so, and uh, uh, we went to Tachikawa, where we landed. That's about 30 miles south of Tokyo, and we we there was a a blonde-haired bombardier that went with us just to to go to Japan, and he was a real blonde, and uh, he had a haircut in, in, the, in, in the town there, and he had a big audience, let me tell you, because he was the first time the Japanese ever saw a blonde, blonde hair. They all had dark black hair, and that was, that was funny. So that's, uh, we went back to, uh, to Aishima, and then we went to, uh, to uh, Okinawa. Talk for a minute about uh, uh, food. What were, you, what were you eating? Well, we were eating sea rations. Which are what? Canned, uh, big cans of, uh, of food, of chicken. No hot, uh, no hot food then? Uh, well, we, we had a mess hall. They, they built a mess hall out of a, a, a Quonset hut type. And uh, the Japanese were uh, used to service the prisoners. And this one little Japanese uh, soldier that was doubling out the, uh, the food. Yeah, there was, uh, we had it, they heated that up after the, yeah, that was heated up. And, well, was it safe on the island at night? Oh yeah. yeah you no, weren't worried about no, security? No, 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 that was, that was all cleared off after, after the Marines took it over and they, they cleaned off the island. The only thing is they told us to stay out of the, uh, the, the mountain there with all the trenches and caves there, uh, it, it was a terrible smell of dead bodies in there. It was unbelievable. So we didn't we didn't go in anyway because of that stench. And uh, but uh, while we were there, we we had a typhoon. It was a big typhoon, and I remember all the boats in uh, Buckner Bay and uh, Okinawa. They went out to sea. So they don't have to. They wouldn't crash into each other, and that typhoon, uh, 160 mile an hour winds, and uh, we had uh, squad tents, and we took two by fours and put where the pegs would hold down the corners of this tent, and it, it held up, believe it or not, to 160 mile an hour winds, but it leaked like a sieve. And, it, it it just went right up against, all around the, the tent, it went up against the center pole, and we were in our cots and we were sleeping with, trying to get some sleep with the helmet liners on and the raincoat. And it, it, didn't, it didn't help too much, almost being like being out there without, without the wind. But uh, every, all, all, most of the tents blew down and uh, I don't know if I have pictures of the tents. Some, a lot of them, are blown down. And uh, and then uh, uh, then we went uh, over to uh, Okinawa. And we, we, on Okinawa or on any of those islands, did you see any of the USO shows? Did, was there any entertainment? Well, there was some entertainment. I forget what we had. There wasn't too much uh, going on at that time. Not at that time. Uh, uh, we, uh, like I say, we went over to uh, Okinawa and became part of the 8th Air Force. We were in the 15th Air Force in the South Pacific. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the 5th Air Force. Uh, and uh, the 8th came over after they finished beating the Germans. and. Uh, we were assigned to an air sea rescue squadron. I remember we had a uh, we had a uh, B-17, and they put a wooden lifeboat on the bottom, and they drop it like a like a bomb right out of the plane when people any anybody went in in the ocean. And uh, I don't know how successful they were. I never was on one of those, but. Uh, we had a helicopter, Sikorsky, 
I think it was RS5. I think it was a square thing. Uh, I think there's a picture of it there. I think I had one anyway. And uh, I remember uh, one of the helicopter pilots took a one of his officer's friends to uh, had a friend on one of the boats in Buckner Bay and he wanted to go see him so he put him in a uh, one of these uh, rope the baskets to see it, and lowered him down and he came and picked him up later after he saw his friend on the battleship or whatever it was and what happened was this uh, young uh, lieutenant he was flying in the in that basket there, and, uh, and he fell out, and he didn't know how to swim, and he hit the bunker in the bay, and he drowned. So that was a tragedy, and uh, uh, just from then on, we, uh, with the war over, what we did uh, on Okinawa was play a lot of sports. We played a lot of football and basketball, and. Then much of it, uh, waiting for our, because the only way you get home, you had to have so many points, so many points for uh, being overseas in the battle zone and etc. So you, when you reach a certain amount, then you could go home. Well, we finally, finally got enough to go home, I did, and uh, we had to go, we didn't fly home, we had, we went on a troop ship and that was a, uh, Admiral class that held, I don't know, maybe about three or four thousand troops. And uh, it wasn't too comfortable, and uh, it was very hot, and uh, we were assigned down below. And what I did is well, we took our air mattresses, and I slept on, on the deck under a lifeboat, which was, was comfortable anyway. And uh, because it was an air mattress. And we, instead of going right down to the Panama Canal, we had to get supplies. So we had to go way over to uh, Honolulu to pick up supplies. Unbelievable. And then we, from there, we picked up the supplies, went through the Panama Canal, and that was in, at least uh, it was interesting going through the canal and uh, up to New York. It took us 29 days on the water, and uh, it was a boring trip, believe me. And we hit New York, and then uh, from there to the, uh, Camp Dix, I think it was, and then uh, we were up to. Uh, uh, the, the place that I took off. Oh, from, Massachusetts. In, yeah, uh, Mass in uh, what's the name of the? Was it War Warren over or? The, um, the war is over. Yeah. yeah. No. What? Uh, what was the name of the base in the, Massachusetts? Where I went originally. From, yeah. Uh, Not Fort Devens. Was Fort it? Devens. Oh, Devens. Okay. We went to Fort Devens and uh, uh, was discharged from there. And. Uh, so you're discharged in Fort Devens, Mass. Yeah. You take the train home? How'd you get Yeah, I got, took the train home. And, and will you come back to Stratford? And Stratford to the... What do you remember? My same, my same house that I grew up in. And, uh, and Were they all waiting for you? People they, waiting oh, for yeah, you? Oh, yeah. that's uh, They knew we were there, and uh, I called up. And uh, and then we uh, we went to the... Uh, we, all the Most of the veterans, it was during the... Uh, summertime there, we uh, we joined the 5220 club, they called it, where uh, you could get 52 weeks uh, looking for a job and they pay you, we got paid so much a month until we, and you could go to school, so that, that's where I... And what, so you decided to go to school? Went to UB, yeah. And for what? For engineering. And uh, when I went the first went to UB, it was uh, the Junior College of Connecticut. And then, which was a big house on Fairfield Avenue in Bridgeport. And we used to go to Decline for assemblies and things of that nature. 
And then it, that's when it became the um, University of Bridgeport and they started to buy up Seaside Park properties. And from that building went down to Seaside Park to become the first time of the Bridge, Bridgeport U. And uh, all the veterans were there and that's uh, so you, you get your you got your engineering it, engineering for uh, free and, yeah and what did you end up doing well then I went uh, I, uh, I I went to GE to get a job I went put an application and they said well, we didn't have anything uh, in the GE at this time but we should have in a couple a few a month or so so I in the meantime a friend of mine was working in the town engineering department he said we have a position open why don't you apply, which I did. And I uh, worked in engineering for a couple of months and I enjoy, was enjoying it. And the GE called me up and said, we have a position open for you. But I said, I'm gonna stay where I am. So that's, and I stayed 40 years with the town of Stratford engineering department. And, and you, you met your wife where? I'm, well, I met my wife down at the, uh, uh, Skipper's restaurant in, 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 in Larcher. And uh, she was. And her name is Ruth, what was her name? Hainsworth. Her name was Ruth Hainsworth from Bridgeway. She graduated from Harding. And, uh, and, and uh, so after a couple of years, we got married. And, and, and I. How many children? Four did children. You? And, uh, and what, what are their, your children's names? Our name? children is the Holly. Uh, she got married to a uh, to a fella up in the boss. I uh, went. They went to uh, Northeastern. That's where they met, and she got married. Never came back home after that. And she has three children, and um, uh, there's uh, Alex and uh, Adri and Evan, and then I have another daughter, Diane. Simses, she lives in Lordship, and she has uh, 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 J J uh, Jimmy, their only son, uh, child, and um, and I have uh, a Chuck. My uh, his name is uh, Charles Jr., and he has uh, two children, a boy and a girl. Uh, uh, who he's married to Amy, and uh, and uh, Holly's married to Michael Salmon. But Holly kept my last name. I don't know why, but she kept my last name. And uh, and Chuck has uh, he's married to uh, Cynthia, and uh, they have uh, Charles the third, and uh, uh, and she, they have a daughter. Uh, uh, I can't remember her name. Uh, uh, boy, I, I get shot. Uh, ele uh, oh, crap. We'll come back to it, sorry. Right. I can't believe this. And and then there's uh, Bobby, my son Bob, who has two children. Bobby, uh, his son Bobby, and uh, who was, uh, what, nine or ten? Nine. Uh, and uh, uh, their daughter, uh, Heather. Oh, Alicia is Chuck's daughter's name. Alicia. All right. <laughs> so that, that brings us uh, up, up to date. That brings us up to date. Right. And, uh, now, t tell me, uh, what is the experience of having served in the war... Uh, uh, to end wars, if you will, because uh, you, the war that saved this country. What do you will you reflect upon that? Uh, how, how do you feel about that? Well, I, I, uh, the these uh, the the Axis powers were so bad. I mean, the Germans killing all the people and the Jews and the everybody else and the. And uh, the Japs do a uh, Japanese doing the same thing. It uh, you 
that's the big reason why we all joined up. I mean, we had to, we couldn't let this go on, and and uh, I think it was the greatest generation in my my era. I mean, it was. Uh, I think the, I think all the men in that era that era with joining up. There aren't there weren't too many that didn't uh, volunteer. Well, I, that about concludes uh, this interview. Well, thank you so much for asking me for my experiences, and uh, uh, I, w I wish all the v veterans a lot of luck. And I, there aren't too many of us left. I'm uh, going to be 88 in January, and uh, my brother-in-law, Charlie Clark, he was a veteran. He's 90. 90, it'll be 98 next month, and he bowls three times a week. <laughs> That's terrific. <laughs> terrific. Well, thank you for oh, thank you. serving our thank country. You. It's a pleasure having interviewed Charles Bernasi. Thanks so much.